Have you ever experienced the failure of a bike part while trying a line or a move that you've done many times before it breaks? If so, have you considered why did that happen? Let me give you a hint, probably it was not due to the overload of the part that failed. But if it was not overload, what caused the failure? Hi guys and welcome back to The Bike Cave Last month I snapped my fork while trying a drop gap and I think that is the perfect opportunity to discuss a bit on why some parts snap while trying moves that we've tried many times before and maybe had withstood even bigger impacts during their service life I know that some of you may have experienced such sudden and unexpected breakages of parts and I hope this video will help you understand why that happens sometimes as I told you in the beginning of this video, such failure cases of parts are not the result of parts overload. Actually, your parts may have faced much bigger impacts in the past. So, what caused their failure if it's not overload? Basically, your parts usually suffer more from the repeating regular loading during your riding than the rare cases that you come close to their strength limit. These repeating load cycles may drive the material of any part to its fatigue limit and finally cause its failure. At that point, I should mention that we've already discussed about material fatigue during the chain replacement frequency video, and so you may have heard about the main idea of this video, but today we're going to dive a bit more into the theory of fatigue. If you haven't already watched this video, you can find the relevant link in the description below, and I bet you know what to do to get notified about the upcoming videos and never lose a video again. But enough with this introduction, let's discuss about the basics of material fatigue failure mode and better understand why sometimes our bike parts are destined to fail. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to discuss about the fork I've snapped, but the same principles apply to any part of your bikes. So, my fork is designed to withstand the loads it's subjected to while riding up to a maximum load, which means that once you're under its upper load bearing limit, you're safe. And generally, this is what happens and we're all safe while riding. On the other hand, if you overload your fork, its material will plastically deform and probably fail catastrophically. But there are cases that our parts fail without even being overloaded. In that case, there is another phenomenon that is to take the blame, and actually, this failure mechanism acts as a timed bomb initiated at the first time we use any of our parts and works silently without showing any signs before the final failure. As already mentioned, this material failure mode is called fatigue and is caused due to the repeating loading of a part well below its material strength limit. But let's dive a bit deeper into the mechanism that drives material fatigue. So every time a part is being loaded, microscopic movements are caused to the atoms that are arrayed to the crystal structure of the material. These micro displacements are continued every time the part is loaded and after a lot of load cycles there is no room for further displacements because any crystal structure discontinuities have reached grain boundaries. And at that point, microscopic cracks start to form within the crystal structure of the material. These microscopic cracks can start forming well under the load limit of the material and this is why fatigue cannot be avoided most of the times. So as the part continues to get repeatedly loaded during riding, these microscopic cracks are being propagated and start transitioning to the macro scale. However, they are still not observable as they have been initiated inside the part. However, the larger the cracks are getting, the more they act as stress concentration points and keep in mind that they have been already initiated on a high stress area of the part. So any of your parts, or my fork in the case's scope, have been transformed into a bomb that ticks every time you load it by doing a move. Finally, you may have guessed that the final stage of these ever-propagating and usually not visible cracks is the actual failure of the part that is sudden and unexpected. Fatigue failed parts always have a distinctive appearance and here is a photo of my previously snapped forks where you can see that the pattern is actually almost identical. As you can see, there is an area that the crack has been initiated and propagated and then the rest of the material has been snapped completely with no sign of significant plastic deformation. If you search for similar cases of fatigue cracks online, you'll find many case studies and photos showing similar signs of failure on various parts and applications. Ok, if we discuss what is material fatigue and understood its mechanism that actually causes a part to fail, but how can we predict and possibly avoid the failure of a part? For this one, we are going to dive a bit deeper into the actual theory of mechanical behavioral materials. So, our only way to study this phenomenon and determine the fatigue endurance of a material is by subjecting a part to cyclical loading and counting the actual load cycles that it endures before failure. The same experiment is repeated for different load magnitudes and the result is the so-called SN curve for the specific material which indicates the number of load cycles to failure for a given stress level. 
So for example, here is the fatigue curve for 70-75 T6 aluminum alloy and this indicates that when a part is stressed at 200 MPa, it needs about 100,000 load cycles to fail. Note that the horizontal axis follows a logarithmic scale, which means that each indication implies 10 times more load cycles than the previous one. Also, note that for very low stress magnitudes, the life of the part can be considered infinite, and this actually happens for some of the parts that live on our bikes forever. This may be okay for the theoretical study of materials, but we have to somehow find a way to practically make use of this theory, as it's impossible to load our bikes and the respective parts equally each time. Actually, our bike parts may be subjected to various loads, ranging from the lightest ones up to loads that may be quite close to the actual upper strength limit of the material. To sort out this one, we have to discuss about the minus rule that may not be perfect, but will give us a starting point to understand how riding affects the material fatigue mechanism. According to Miner's rule, each load case consumes a proportion of the part's life as a percentage of the total load cycles considering the specific load magnitude. So, picture that every time you ride, you consume a different proportion of any part's life during any move you make up to the point that the part fails. For example, loading a part made out of 70-75 T6 aluminum alloy so as to get stressed at 200 MPa for 10,000 cycles would mean that 10% of the fatigue life have been consumed for this part and the rest 90% is left for other load cases. So having said all this, you may have understood up to now that the harder you ride, the higher the stresses will be on your parts and thus, the higher is the percentage of the life that is consumed each time and hence, the sooner the part will fail. However, I know that's impractical and impossible to actually count the load cycles of your parts and calculate their life expectancy. So, what can we all do to predict and prevent future failures on our parts? We can statistically approach the prediction of fatigue failure mode given that we all have our own riding style and we may train in similar intensity every time while probably following a pretty standard training schedule. I know that this seems a bit fuzzy, but it's the only way that we can approach this issue. So if a part fails after a specific time of use and its failure can be blamed to fatigue considering everything that we've discussed up to now, we can use the service time of this part to estimate its fatigue life expectancy. Then we can consider a safety factor for this time and schedule the replacement of this part a bit earlier than the time it took for the previous one to fail. This is a rough estimation, but it's the only way to predict the life expectancy of a part for our personal use case. However, sometimes it may be quite inaccurate, especially if you try to improve your riding and change your technique or try bigger moves, as this will change dramatically the statistical distribution of the load cycles and may lead to premature and hence unexpected failure of the parts. Actually, this happened to me as I've snapped my fork three times and I still cannot predict its life expectancy as my technique has changed a lot during the course of the past couple of years. So, my first fork lasted for about one and a half years and then I decided to replace it again after one year so as to have half a year of safety. However, my second fork snapped after 10 months and so I reconsidered its life expectancy and I decided to replace it again after 6 to 8 months but it snapped again after 6 months. So, does this mean that I should replace again my fork after 6 months? Probably yes, otherwise I should probably experiment with a more expensive carbon fork that will probably last considerably longer as composites show excellent fatigue resistance compared to aluminum. But they also cost a lot more and given that I ride a lot of natural terrains, I tend to scratch my fork a lot when I fail or hit it on rocks and thus I don't want to risk damage in an expensive carbon fork by possibly delaminating its reinforcing fabric layers. So I'm going to stick to aluminum forks for now and either I'm going to replace my fork in 4-6 to six months, preferably before it snaps again or I'm going to do something more drastic to make sure that my fork will last a bit longer until my technique improves and I start landing a bit smoother. However, I would like to keep the focus of this video on the mechanism of the fatigue failure mode and so I'll keep the fork related experimentations for the next one. In the meantime, if you follow me on social media, you may have noticed some hints of what I did to my fork and I'm quite excited to share this one with you guys. But I'm quite curious, do you keep track of the life expectancy of any of your parts that may fail quite consistently? If so, what are the parts that you regularly schedule the replacement as a measure of preventive maintenance and how long do you keep them on your bike? That's it for today guys and I hope that this one helped you understand why some parts fail unexpectedly and hopefully now you got a better understanding of what fatigue is. Thank you so much for subscribing and watching and until next time, have fun riding your bikes and I can't wait to show you what I did on my new fork.